Hello, and welcome to this Atlantic Council event on space traffic management, time for action. I'm Clementine Starling. I lead the Atlantic Council's for Defence practice. The impetus for today's discussion is for Defence's newest report, which highlights the challenges to and opportunities for space traffic management. Space traffic management, or SDM, is the ability of international and national bodies to track and regulate space objects. Our authors advance nine key steps to chart the way forward for a globally coordinated STM policy framework. Today, we'll hear from Deputy Commander of US Space Command, Lieutenant General John Shaw, as well as a distinguished panel of experts on this topic. I'd like to thank our speakers and you, our audience, for joining us today. Here at the Atlantic Council, our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop non-partisan and sustainable strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. We honor General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and seek to embody his non-partisan commitment to the cause of security. Consistent with that mission, our forward defense practice is designed to shape the debate around the greatest security challenges facing the United States and its allies and create forward-looking assessments of the trends, technologies, and concepts that will define the future of security. The ability of the United States to deter and, if necessary, fight and win wars is increasingly tied to our ability to operate in space. As space activity proliferates, the increased risk of collision between spacecraft and with space debris jeopardizes safety and security priorities. With increased crowding in Earth's orbits, space traffic management needs to urgently be addressed. As our authors Mia Sadat and Julia Siegel state, it is no longer sufficient to know the location of spacecraft and space debris. Instead, it is imperative to have a common understanding of and management over maneuver in a congested environment. This discussion will delve into the challenges of space traffic management, current regulations, the shaping of norms for acceptable behavior in outer space, and what space traffic management could look like in the future. Today's event is generously supported by Maxar Technologies, and we are very grateful to be joined by Dr. Walter Scott, Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at Maxar, who will provide some remarks next before I introduce the panel. Dr. Scott founded Digital Globe in 1992, which was later acquired by Maxar Technologies. Previously, Walter held several leadership positions at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Walter, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Clementine. And, uh, you know, in addition to my job title at Maxar, um, I've I found that I'm adding a new role, which is as uh, a space environmentalist, uh, as an advocate for the responsible use of space so that it can be preserved for future generations, uh, many to come. Uh, a little about who Maxar is. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen the satellite imagery of the Russian invasion of Ukraine that were taken by Maxar satellites. Uh, but in addition to that, Maxar builds satellites ourselves. Uh, if you've listened to Sirius XM radio, chances are it was a Maxar satellite. Uh, for remote learning in the Australian outback, communications, um, we've built over 300 commercial satellites over our history and have something like 90 of them operating on orbit today. Um, and we've built the robot arms on the Mars landers and are building the power and propulsion element of the Lunar Gateway as part of the Artemis program for going back to the moon. And uh, we're building our own next generation Earth observation satellites, Worldview Legion. So Maxar was very, very much in the middle of the space business as a builder, as an operator, and as a user. Uh, and space is important to all of us. We rely on it for communications, for weather, for positioning via GPS, for satellite radio, watching NFL Sunday ticket, and increasingly for Earth observation. Uh, to shine a light of global transparency on the actions of tyrants, like we've seen pretty compellingly in the case of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And now is very much the time to act. Um, we'll hear, uh, we have heard and will hear about space getting increasingly crowded uh, with many more countries and companies launching satellites. 
And this issue is uh, particularly important for Maxar. It's come pretty close to home. Uh, in 19, or 2016, Worldview 2, one of our spacecraft, was hit by a piece of untracked space debris. And it knocked off a corner of one of the solar arrays. Uh, we were fortunate, uh, didn't do any serious damage to the satellite, but the fact that we could directly experience the impact of space debris uh, was certainly uh, a uh, an unpleasant reminder of the importance of the space environment. And we've had to maneuver our satellite several times to avoid other spacecraft that lack their own maneuvering capability, as well as maneuvering to avoid debris. So there's a growing sense within industry as well as government that common sense rules of the road are needed now to ensure that space remains usable for future generations, along with policies and tools to enable debris remediation, uh, not just watching the problem grow, but actually starting to do something about it. And I'm very, very much looking forward to having a robust discussion on the issues. Back to you, Clementine. Thank you, Walter. Um, I will introduce our panelists uh, before introducing our keynote speaker, General Shaw, and hand you over to him. Um, so in addition to Dr. Walter Scott, today's panelists include Dr. Mariel Barowitz, an Associate Professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology's Sam Nunn School of International Affairs, and Dr. Mia Sadat, a non-resident senior fellow with Ford Defense at the Atlantic Council, and the first of our authors of today's report, Space Traffic Management, Time for Action. Our moderator today is Julia Siegel, the second of our authors and an assistant director in Ford Defense. And now I'm honored to welcome Lieutenant General John E. Shaw. General Shaw is Deputy Commander of US Space Command, which is the unified combatant command responsible for conducting US operations in, from, and to space. Prior to his current position, he dual-hatted as the commander of US Space Command's Combined Forces Space Component Command and as deputy commander of US Space Forces Space Operations Command. He has served in numerous positions focusing on air and space operations, including tours in the Space Warfare Center, and the 50th Space Wing. So thank you for joining us today. Before I turn it over to General Shaw, just a couple of housekeeping notes. I'd like to remind everyone that this event is public and on the record, and we encourage all of our Zoom participants to please ask questions using the Q&A tab, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. Julia will note your questions throughout and pose some of your questions to our panelists. Um, so make sure you get your questions in early and please identify yourself, your name, your affiliation. And for those on Twitter, please use the hashtag for defense to join the discussion. Without further ado, finally, please join me in welcoming General Shaw. So over to you. Hey, well, good afternoon. Thanks, Clementine. Thank, uh, thanks, Dr. Scott for Maxar for uh, uh, hosting this event. And, um, and, and thanks for the opportunity to open as a keynote. And I think my guess is the uh, the folks organizing this uh, um, probably could have had someone from Department of Commerce deliver a keynote. That would have been appropriate. So what I'll try to do, though, is I think maybe I can provide a backdrop of why now. Why right now is I absolutely agree with the way the forum is teed up here that this is a time for action. Why now we are at a tipping point. In our in our in our use of space, our space utilization where we need to really move to the next level with regard to space traffic management. And I'll talk a little bit about why I believe that is true. I also am not envious. Uh, I know the I know these panel members that you're going to listen to. I'm not envious of Julia having to uh, uh, corral uh, all of those speakers um, in that next session. So good luck, Julia. Uh, good luck with that. Glad I don't have that task. Um, hey, I think uh, let me start by saying so two things. First, as I said before, we're at a tipping point where this needs to happen and we need to transition to space traffic management being managed by someone other than the Department of Defense and it needs to be taken up to the next level. And the second thing I would say, that's actually a wonderful thing. It's wonderful that we as a society and as a planet have gotten to the point where space utilization is so great across our society that we've reached this tipping point. That we have to do that. So I think it's actually a great thing and, and I'm optimistic about it uh, as a way for us to further our endeavors in space across all sectors um, as we move forward. 
I think it's probably worth, I guess as a keynote, I should probably start by saying, what, what is space traffic management? Uh, Julia gave you a pretty good definition there early on. There's a definition that's very similar to hers, a little bit more expanded in Space Policy Directive 3, which I hope this audience is aware of, that was published uh, in the, in the uh, previous presidential administration that basically got the ball rolling towards uh, space traffic management and having Department of Commerce take those responsibilities. But let's kind of break it apart just very quickly so we actually know what we're talking about when we say space traffic management. I'll just use the three words, space. So it's activity that's happening in, in space, which we are defining here at US Space Command, which is our area of responsibility as uh, everything 100 kilometers and above, uh, above 100 kilometers uh, above a mean sea level and expanding outward indefinitely, that's space. Then there's the word traffic. Well, that should be objects that are in space doing whatever their missions or purposes are. They could be exploration, they could be commercial, they could be civil, they may be national security. It is also activity that is transiting to and from the space domain. So launches into space and reentries from space, I think qualify as traffic. So they're part of space traffic management. And I would also point out that it isn't just physical objects. When we talk about traffic, that is also electromagnetic traffic either within the space domain or transiting to and from the space domain. And SPD3 is pretty clear on that part too. It's both physical and electromagnetic. And then management, we could spend a lot of time about that. There are a lot of tasks that are laid out in Space Policy Directive 3 uh, about uh, what, is what is encompassed by space traffic management. It's doing the day-to-day -day operations of tracking objects in space and looking for potential collisions and making announcements about those collisions. Uh, but it's also a little bit more forward-leaning about establishing rules of the road and norms of behavior for safe operations within the space domain. And we, there are many other activities that lump underneath those, those, those macro charges to, uh, to whomever is going to do space traffic management. So when we capture that and we say what, that's what space traffic management is, then I think the next question we can ask is what, you could ask me because I said it, why are we at a tipping point? How did we get here? And why is this now the right time, the time for action as the policy of this forum is, to really move forward with space traffic management underneath the Department of Commerce? So probably worth just kind of backing up and taking a look at this from a historical perspective. When we first started moving into the space domain in the late 1950s into the 1960s, it was the vast preponderance of capabilities that were being put into space were for national security purposes. There was some scientific, absolutely. There was some exploration, of course. We all remember the Mercury and Gemini and Apollo activities, but the lion's share of it was national security. And what capabilities did we have as a nation to understand what was happening in the space domain and to track anything that was, on there, was, was happening there? And again, the vast majority of those capabilities were for national security purposes. They were mostly uh, radars and optical sensors run by the Department of Defense. So a little kind of alternate history to way to look at this would be what if the radar, the, the radar that came about in, in use operationally in World War II, what if that had predated our ability to uh, fly in the air? What if we had the radar before 1903 in the Wright brothers' flight? Um, who would have been using that radar? Well, there wasn't anything in the air domain to actually track at that time. But once we started to move into the air domain, most of the needs probably would have been for national security purposes. And indeed, that's how those radars became operational in World War II. So just with a little bit of counterfactual history, we could probably make the argument this isn't something strange. This is what we would start with, national security capabilities to understand this domain in which most of the objects operating are for national security purposes. And that's how we evolved. And as more and more activity went into the space domain, the, the market share of what was national security space started to decline, but it was still very important. And we got to a sort of a normal that we've been using for the last 20 plus years which is the Department of Defense, which had been doing it from the beginning, was, is basically, and even today, is doing 
many of those elements of space traffic management that were outlined in SPD3. And we do this and we share this data. We share this data with the world on spacetrack.org. We work very closely with NASA and the International Space Station to determine if there are any potential threats by debris to the ISS. And we, we, we push that data to NASA and they analyze it, decide if they need to take any actions in maneuvering the space station or, take it, or sheltering astronauts or otherwise. But we've now come to a point, I believe, due to a number of factors, not the least of which are more and more commercial activity, technological advances in microsatellites, a reduction in the cost of launch into space, and the development of peripheral, proliferated low Earth orbit constellations. A lot of these have just kind of a new surge that makes it a tipping point, and it's time for all of these activities that were done by the Department of Defense to be done by an organization that can better manage space traffic for the nation and for the world. There's also been another development. And again, because our space utilization has become so great across all sectors, including national security and our war fighting or joint war fighting force, that we are now seeing threats in the space domain that we did not see before. And those are proliferating. So you could look back and say, whereas the Department of Defense could probably manage space traffic management and kind of look at potential threats in the space domain and track other objects for national security purposes, where those uh, activities overlapped enough that DOD could do it. Uh, my proposal to you today is that those are separating enough now and it's a wide enough spectrum that is no longer, DOD is no longer the right organization to be doing space traffic management now that we need to focus on space domain awareness, uh, potential threats, protecting and defending our space capabilities, and looking further outward than we ever have before. That kind of separation that we're now seeing, which I would call this tipping point today, is why it's now time to really move forward with space traffic management. So where are we today? Well, actually, perfect timing for this forum. Some remarkable announcements made last Friday at the National Space Council. I'll leave it to everyone else to kind of look those up if you hadn't seen them already. Uh, there was actually a memorandum of agreement that was signed by the Department of Commerce, by my boss, General Dickinson, a U.S. Space Command, by General Raymond, the Chief of Space Operations, and by Dr. John Plum of OST Policy, a memorandum of agreement on how we're going to take this all to the next level. Now, since SBD3 came out, we actually have been working with Department of Commerce, kind of setting up how are we going to do this together? What is the real problem statement? What are the resources we think the Department of Commerce needs? Now it's time to take it to the next level. Some of you are thinking, yeah, it's about time. SPD3 was signed quite a while ago. Well, let's put it in cosmic terms. From when SPD was signed, the light that left the nearest star to our solar system, Alpha Centauri, still hasn't reached us. So in the broader scheme of things, we're moving along and we're making progress. What happens next? Well, we are going to continue to work closely with the Department of Commerce and uh, now, now that uh, and, and with their, uh, their Office of Space Commerce to share data, to allow them to develop the tools and the practices and the process from a Department of Commerce perspective, not from a Department of Defense perspective, where they can move forward and start to be the lead for space traffic management for the nation and, again, I think for the world, setting the, setting the, 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 the course for, for all of us uh, operating in the space domain. And I think it's an exciting time and it's the right time for it to happen. You know, you could use another metaphor. We could say that uh, looking back, um, the DOD has been using the equivalent of the Air Force's airborne early warning platforms, it's AWACS, to do air traffic control. I mean, that's the rough analogy of what's actually happening. And that might be okay if the preponderance of things in the air are national security concerns and you just have a few one-offs doing civil or commercial, which again was kind of where we were a few couple decades ago when we first got started. But now we have threats we need to be worried about and Department of Defense needs to, con needs to concentrate on that. And we need to move uh, what is the equivalent of air traffic control to the equivalent of the FAA, which is going to be Department of Commerce. It's an analogy that holds up fairly well. We just can't afford to have the resources of our capabilities in the DOD the same way the Air Force cannot afford the resources of the AWACS 
to manage the rapidly expanding amount of traffic in our domain that we're seeing. It's time for a change. So I think it's exciting. I would just close by saying it's actually a wonderful opportunity. It means that things are really happening in the space domain and we need to move to new levels to understand how we're gonna manage that activity, how we're gonna set conditions for transparency, uh, for um, to, to, to increase confidence in the operation in that domain, to increase investment in that domain from across all sectors and really move us forward. If space of the 1960s and 70s and 80s was the Arctic Ocean, rather sparse, traveled by very few platforms and many national security related, then the space of today and tomorrow is the Mediterranean. It's being crisscrossed by actors and platforms and capabilities and organizations of every conceivable kind across many sectors and that's only gonna increase. And if you see the, what we have, where we have been to where we've come, that is why we're at a tipping point today. Department of Defense and US Space Command in particular looks forward to partnering with Department of Commerce and making space traffic management the norm for that department and for our nation and for the world. So thanks again. I hope I set a decent keynote that will get our, uh, our panelists uh, ready to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, counter anything I had to say uh, and where I might have been, been off base. But uh, thanks for this forum. I think this perfect timing to have this discussion given the MOA that was signed last Friday and look forward to seeing what comes in the days to come. Thanks so much. Thank you, General Shaw. Um, thanks for joining us today and thanks for setting the scene for our panel discussion. Um, and thanks to everyone else as well for tuning in for this discussion. Um, I wanna reinforce what Clementine mentioned earlier. We will be taking audience questions later in this event. So if you're tuning in via Zoom, uh, feel free to use that Zoom Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, share your name, um, affiliation, and a question, and we'll get to those later on. Um, Mir, Walter, Mariel, thanks so much for joining us today. Mir, I'd like to start with you, uh, since you authored this issue brief on space traffic management, time for action. Could you pro provide an overview of our study and um, the most significant takeaways? Um, and then also kind of in addition to that, would you like to add anything to General Shaw's definition of space traffic management and reasoning for why this issue deserves urgent attention right now? No, I'm not gonna negate General Shaw, but uh, I'm very um, um, excited that he's, uh, I, that, that he's um, been championing DOD and uh, commerce to come to the starting line and uh, what we got to start doing is we got to move past the starting line. So we, we're going to definitely now be more critical of DOD and Department of Commerce and the whole of government because now they signed up, they got the shoes on, and they're at the starting line. Um, regarding the, the study, it's really, uh, I would say, not a new study per se, right? It's not earth shattering new study into STM, but what it was is the works of uh, other great thinkers like Mariel and others who have come uh, and studied various corners of this STM discussion, we were able to uh, put it all together into one sort of uh, study and then critique some of that uh, and then define some of the terms as well as uh, discuss the whole idea of, you know, what defines SSA, right? Space Situational Awareness and the confusion that people sometimes use SSA and STM interchangeably, that there's a difference between the two um, that there is a need to establish a minimum standard uh, um, of conduct in space, which also involves not just norms and behaviors and so forth, but also cybersecurity. It involves, uh, you know, the whether a spacecraft is maneuverable or not maneuverable, these kind of discussions as well. The idea of uh, what is liability, how do we assign liability, who assigns it, um, distinguishing between even orbitologies, right? Well, how does how does STM differ between that? and you know, certain things that are currently in the co commercial domain, like LEO, is not necessarily the same thing when you look further out into cislunar, right? It's more, uh, it, it, it's it's not developed as yet, right? It's like sort of the, the not the, the suburbs, but really the hinterlands of America, right? The, the roads haven't gone there yet, but we're expecting it to be paved soon, and we're expecting STM in that uh, 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 sort of location as well. And then um, allocation of responsibility and um, authority. So I think the study looked at that. What we did, though, was very different other than you and I sitting down and sort of putting our heads together. What we did is we put um, consultative bodies together of different experts. And some of those experts uh, uh, you know, agreed to be listed at the end of the report. And so we interviewed them. 
we sort of drilled uh, questions into them further. And then we kind of put that all together uh, because what we didn't want to do is we didn't want a, you know, a, a author centric perspective. What we wanted is something broad based. And so that can be convincing when we take it to the policymakers and to the strategists and say, here's what sort of the wider body of experts and practitioners think. Great. Thanks, Mir. Um, Walter, from where you sit at Maxar, how does space traffic management or a lack of regulation surrounding STM impact US and allied commercial interests um, and industry um, at large? Uh, I guess there are a couple of ways. Um, uh, first off, the definition of space traffic management is more than just watching. Um, it moves into norms of behavior as well as um, the regulatory framework that goes along with that. Uh, there have been some positive moves in that direction. The FCC has now said uh, instead of 25 years uh, to have your satellite re-enter after end of life, it's now five years. Uh, that's a positive step from a regulatory standpoint. Um, other elements that are important are uh, sharing of your planned maneuvers. Just like when you're driving on the road, you use your turn signal when you're about to change lanes. Uh, it's generally a good idea, particularly in a congested environment, to have a mechanism for signaling when you plan to make an orbit adjust maneuver so that you reduce the likelihood uh, that you are orbit adjusting into the path of somebody else. Uh, and there are a variety of other elements that enable space operators to feel, one, that their assets are, that their assets are safe. More importantly, that you are not wasting a lot of effort performing collision avoidance maneuvers that consume fuel, that are uh, a distraction often to the operation of the satellite. Better coordination means things run more smoothly. It's just like, you know, in the uh, when when roads were introduced for automobiles and there were no traffic lights, um, it was a mess. Traffic lights, uh, while we tend to hate them, they make traffic slow, flow a lot more smoothly than in the absence of traffic lights. Thank you. Mariel, I wonder if you could go back to our earlier discussion on definitions. Um, General Shaw laid out a definition, um, Mira added to the importance of definitions. Um, so could you please characterize how space situational awareness or SSA um, is different from or similar to space traffic management? Um, and as General Shaw mentioned, the DOD is moving towards space domain awareness. So how does space moder monitoring more broadly um, affect security? Yeah, so I would say space situational awareness is kind of the foundation you need in order to do space traffic management. So um, as some of the others have, have mentioned, space, tra space situational awareness is about monitoring all the objects in space. So operational satellites, debris, where is everything right now? Where is it going to be in the future? Um, and, and kind of what is the, the purpose of that object up there? Um, space domain awareness, kind of the military term uh, that came up a couple of years ago for this, is actually really similar uh, in terms of, from a practical perspective, what they're watching, the information they need, those kinds of things. But I think it really signals there's a different purpose, right? Um, and, and like the general said, it's the difference between uh, civil air traffic management, right? You're just trying to coordinate all these different commercial companies versus, you know, watching what's happening in the air during a conflict, right? You're looking, you're still going to use, you know, the same kind of monitoring technologies and things like that, but you're looking for different types of behaviors. So I think you have those, you know, that role of monitoring, whether you call it space situational awareness and talk about it on the civil side or space domain awareness and, and thinking from a military perspective, that monitoring is, is really important. But it's only the first step, right? It, it's kind of providing you the foundation of where things are so then you can do something about it, right? And that's the the next really you know important piece. That's the space traffic management. Um, and so there, I think it's you know now we know we have the data to see that there might be a conjunction, right, a potential collision. But what do you do about it? And right now, as others have mentioned, there's no rules about that, right? So we provide that information. The United States shares that information with uh, operators around the world. Uh, but there is no entity out there that says, you know, which of those entities should move or even that they have any obligation to move at all if they if they don't choose to. So 
that is a situation that is probably not uh, sustainable uh, because you will get collisions in space uh, at some point. Great, thank you. Um, and I know you recently testified before Congress on the need for space monitoring to move from DOD to a civil agency. So um, can you give your thoughts on that uh, recent memorandum shifting responsibilities from DOD to the Department of Commerce on space traffic management? Um, a step in the, or the right direction, but is more needed? And if so, um, what's next? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. You know, uh, the general mentioned this as well, that there, there's just been such a growth in the, the commercial and, and civil side of what's happening in space that we need a system that's really focused on that aspect, right? And the, the military has been doing a wonderful job of tracking and of sharing that information freely with operators all over the world. Um, but that's not their main focus. That's not the job they they usually do. So you want to give that job to an entity that um, does have that as their as their primary focus and the main thing they're doing. And I think there's a huge amount of opportunity there. When you go to a civil agency, you can be more transparent. You can work more closely with um, uh, international entities, with commercial entities. Um, but then we still have a lot of questions to answer in terms of exactly how we're going to do that. Um, so that's where I'd say a lot of the opportunity lies, the, the exact design, the types of partnerships, the way we share data, the nature of that data, um, a lot of that is still being figured out right now. Thanks. Walter Mir, would you like to add anything on um, that recent shift, um, how you're viewing it both from your, um, Walter, from, you know, an industry perspective and Mir from uh, your former government hat? Well, I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's going to require uh, not just moving responsibility, but actually creating budget and authorities for commerce to act in much the same way as uh, for air traffic. The FAA uh, had to get authorities through creation of infrastructure, et cetera. Um, I think it's important not just to move authority, but to move rapidly to developing the norms of behavior that are expected for satellite operators. And uh, Maxar is one of a number of companies in the industry that have uh, endorsed a set of best practices, things like if you're flying at an altitude above human habitats, like the space station, you need to have maneuverability. You can't just be a a uh, floating hazard to navigation. You have to be able to maneuver so that you have a partial, you carry responsibility for avoiding collisions, uh, that you be proactive in communicating your plans to maneuver, that you incorporate appropriate cybersecurity and uh, encryption protection so that you're in control of your satellite, somebody else is not, um, and that you don't, you don't litter, you don't, make a mess so that when your satellite reaches its end of life, you deorbit it. You don't leave it sitting up there as a hazard to navigation. You don't create debris. Uh, you don't blow things up in space. Uh, looks great in the movies, but the after effects are pretty pretty nasty. So um, if you've ever seen the movie Gravity, that, that actually was kind of a uh, scientifically inaccurate, but um, sort of emotionally appealing, uh, like this is what could happen with space debris, except it moves a lot faster than they showed it in the movie. I think I would echo the same sentiments. And I would say one of the things that's uh, always a problem in, in government is when responsibility or authorities get shifted, sometimes the budgets <laughs> don't get shifted with it. So we, we have to definitely make sure that Congress and the executive branch really make, you know, make uh, a programmatic aspect and don't leave the Office of Space Commerce to do things, more things, and not be able to have the resources to be able to do those things. And going with that and echoing what uh, Walter kind of mentioned is, you know, being able to track all these debris are great, right? What, what are you going to do once you track all this debris and you say the world's fall, you know, the, the space is falling apart or the, they're all going to crash down on Earth um, because now FCC is saying everything must come down in five years. This, it's great, but we need to start being able to manage these things, right? And that's an important aspect. So is this office going to be also the manager or will it be another office uh, you know, ICAO like uh, that's going to be the manager, and you know we can't we can't wait for a disaster to happen for us to then say we need a manager for this as well. We need a management office. So either this office will grow into that, morph into that, 
or another part of the government or whatever, public-private partnership, whatever it is. But that's the other concern I have is uh, where we are not moving rapidly enough to the exponential growth of space by non-government entities and organizations that we are not able to keep up with what could potentially be a disaster that Walter just mentioned. I guess sort of building on that, if I could, and I know we're being we're being um, unorganized, and uh, um, you're going to have to hurt us back. One area that is related is what do you do about things that are already debris? For that matter, what actually is debris? Um, is it a satellite that's no longer operating? Probably. Is it a spent rocket body? Probably. Um, under whose authority, if you were to go try to remove the debris, who would you need to ask or who would you need to get permission from uh, to move that object uh, so that it's not a hazard to navigation? Uh, so there's there's more than just the management of the active assets, which is about trying not to make the problem worse. There's also how do you deal with stuff that's already up there that represents a potential hazard to navigation. How do you make that better? Because as more and more objects get into space, the risk of collision with things that are no longer operable goes up. It's just a numbers game. Yeah, Walter, building on that point, um, we advance like a policy framework for space traffic management, but recognize that there's technical components that underlie that framework um, and recognize that, you know, we need the ability to track space objects, uh, both space debris and spacecraft, um, need communication between operators and need to be able to remove space junk and debris. So what technical capabilities do you think are most critical to achieving what you just laid out and then just more broadly space traffic management? Um, well, first you have to see it. So, uh, continuing to introduce better ability to observe things in space, whether it's observing them from the ground, typically, you know, radars and telescopes that are used to build tracks, um, non-Earth imaging, being able to actually inspect a satellite that might be having a problem uh, to help the operator diagnose the problem so that it doesn't get any worse. Um, when we think about debris removal, debris comes in all sizes. Uh, there are the tiny, tiny pieces that are so small that they're not even being tracked. But then there are also large objects that if they get hit by a small piece of debris, make lots of more small pieces of debris. So I'd say that the low hanging fruit from a technical standpoint would be developing both the policy framework and the technical approaches to be able to remove some of those larger pieces of debris, like defunct satellites, spent rocket bodies. Um, that's low hanging fruit that can have a disproportionately large impact on reducing the, uh, the potential for growth of debris. Thanks. Mariel, anything you would like to add on the, the technical, technical side of space traffic management? Yeah, I mean, I think another piece that's really important is thinking through the technical impact of some of the potential space traffic management uh, rules and regimes that we could put in place. Um, so for example, you know, I think we've gotten to this point where there's a lot of agreement and we need to have some kind of space traffic management, some kind of agreement about when we do maneuvers and how we do maneuvers and things. Um, but we're only just getting started uh, as a community and, and thinking through what might those rules actually look like. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine, for example, a rule that says we're going to have, you know, uh, military satellites, if they're involved, they are the ones who have the responsibility to maneuver. Or you might say, actually, we're going to have the commercial entities, right? They're they're revenue generating. They're they're up there trying to make money. They should maneuver um, first, right? Uh, and there are different, you know, from a kind of policy political perspective, you can make arguments for both sides. But one piece of information we don't know is how many times do those types of maneuvers happen, right? How much uh, cost in terms of Delta V is that going to impose on various types of actors? Um, so a project I have going right now with a, a colleague in aerospace engineering here at Georgia Tech uh, is trying to look at that types of things. So building an actual simulation of the space environment um, and then going through some of these different rules that we could potentially put in place and trying to understand, you know, do we have the data to actually, you know, impose a rule like that? Um, 
what's the actual impact of that rule? How how often does it occur? What's the the you know distribution of the cost there? Uh, to try to think through some of those things because I think there are rules that um, may make sense on just kind of general conceptual logical level, uh, but then you put them in this model and actually run it and you find oh that that changes you know one or two percent of the the actual conjunctions because it's just not happening. So you don't want to spend a year or more negotiating that on the international level um, when it's just not going to have the impact. So I think that piece of it is another sort of technical element that that we still need to do. Got it. Thanks. Um, yeah. So we we've gone over kind of what space traffic management currently looks like. Some of the you know potential pinch points right now. Uh, something kind of pointed out in the paper is just the fact that to get to most of this movement, we need clear international and national authorities um, to pave the way forward for space traffic management. Um, so currently, what do you all see as the barriers or even opportunities to doing so? Um, Mir, I'll start with you. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I really think that, and I agree with everything Mariel said, that there are externalities for getting out of the gates too quickly and not calculating. At the same time, uh, it's almost we need to do a on spot correction, right? And and recalibrate our bearings because we can't wait for the international community to come to this. It's it's not three na nations anymore. <laughs> We're looking at over 20 uh and and uh, you know little organizations are putting uh you know spacecraft into space as well. And so there are a lot more stakeholders. So we definitely need to lead by example, um, I would say. And one of the things that was mentioned was the orbit, orbital de debris uh, removal. That's one of the areas where the United States can really take a leadership role. You know, we can clean up our own mess, that, and then we can clean up our allies' mess. You know, as a as a kind gesture, right? That's 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 how leaders in the world behave, and I think that's one of the areas where we can really step up. And and there's technology, and other nations, our allies, and like-minded nations have developed that technology, and we can we can scale that. And that's one of the areas we can start doing that. And then the other areas that we can start focusing on is the norms of behavior, uh, you know, um, rewarding uh, nations, if, if they're not allies and partners that have our same mindset, right, they, they drive on their, they drive uh, with uh, mutually agreed upon or uh, agreed upon universally agreed upon rules, right, they just don't swerve all over the place, um, unless it's a drag race, right, then they're, they're not doing that. If they all agree on some similarities, then we all come can come to an agreement. But we can reward those that don't believe in that by coming and becoming part of that norm, right? And we we find ways to reward them. And if if we have to demarch them, if we have to penalize them, when we need to do that as well. I mean, we do that in the other domains on land, air, and sea when nations you know behave recklessly, whether it's the Russians buzzing our um, you know um, our navy vessels or otherwise, we we we, we demarch them for that. We need to start doing that with the space domain, and we need to think about it uh, as something that is even more uh, ca catastrophic if something happens in space. You know, a aircraft uh, crashing into a vessel at sea is is very uh, problematic and it's very dangerous. But something happening in space at the speed that we're going at is going to be like like you know Walter said, it's going to debris begets debris, and so we really need to start focusing on that and get out of the gates. And, and start saying, this is what we want to do, get our allies on board, our partners on board, and then start working with those who would detract. And I can only think of two nations or maybe three right now that might detract. But for the most part, if, if people don't play long in space, nobody gets to benefit from space. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Mariel, anything you'd like to add or Walter? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's lots of opportunities, you know, on the on the political level for how you engage. Um, Mir mentioned earlier the need to bring nations together, right, sooner rather than later. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, we, you know, I don't know if we're even quite at the starting line for that. I think one of the questions is, you know, what is the forum in which you're going to have these discussions? So if you're talking about things like what are the specific rules you might put in place or what's a threshold we could all agree on for, you know, when a maneuver needs to take place. We don't have an obvious forum in which to have those discussions or a process to follow to make those decisions. So you know, I think that we're still maybe a step behind the, the starting line on that particular issue. And I would say that's a really um, very important near-term thing we need to figure out is just how to come together and have that conversation. Um, and then on the active debris removal side, it's been mentioned a couple of times uh, as well, but I think lots of 
opportunity on the kind of international legal framework there, right? So I think um, Walter mentioned earlier, there's issues with, you know, when there's a an object in space, it's uh, the launching entity is liable for that, for that according to the Outer Space Treaty, um, and that's indefinite. So even after that satellite is no longer functional, even if that satellite breaks up into pieces, that um, country is still liable for those pieces, is still responsible for them. And by the way, they own them. No one else can go and take down those pieces without getting permission. So we don't have a process right now uh, that's agreed upon to transfer legal ownership or transfer that liability. Um, there's no kind of salvage law uh, for space that would say after some period of time, you can um, be the good actor and, and take those things down. Um, so there was a great paper a couple of years ago where uh, a number of experts identified the 50 most dangerous objects in space, um, which I thought was a, you know really helpful. Uh, but I can't remember the exact number, like 40 or more of them were from the former Soviet Union. Um, and so they're, they're objects that the U.S. or Europe, who's been a big leader in this area, can't just go in and take them down. Um, so I think that's another, you know, on the on the international legal side, another challenge we need to address. Well, certainly one thing that um, can make forward progress uh, instead of waiting for the, the final frameworks to be fully established, uh, start with industry led voluntary actions that can begin to demonstrate some of the successful practices for how to be responsible operators in space. And those can be things like sharing orbit information, sharing maneuvers in advance. Uh, these days, most spacecraft operators, certainly the ones that are that are operating any kind of a satellite that uses GPS or, or other positioning technology, know what their orbits are pretty accurately. Uh, and so, Providing that information, there's there's not a lot of downside that I can see as a satellite operator to helping improve the accuracy with which orbits of your satellites are known. Uh, it reduces the the likelihood that somebody else is going to have to maneuver, and vice versa. It, it's it's something that's sort of a good all around. Um, having industry start to demonstrate by their actions that industry is willing to abide by common sense rules of the road, uh, some of which we talked about earlier, uh, is a way of giving a level of confidence to policymakers that the rules are likely to be adopted, that people are already starting to behave this way. As opposed to you try to come up with a policy without knowing whether or not you're gonna have uh, adoption of the policy or you're gonna have massive pushback. Can I, I was just going to tie that back to an earlier comment as well. I mean, I think Walter's point about sharing uh, information about where your satellites are located, where they're going, and also you mentioned earlier sharing maneuver information before you actually carry out a maneuver. Um, and I just want to link that. I think that's another potential benefit of this new commerce uh, system is that it can be built with the ability to bring in that type of data in mind, right? When when the DoD was building its system back in the beginning of the space age and the, you know those first few decades, they were not thinking about ingesting a whole bunch of data from individual satellite operators or bringing in maneuver information and, and factoring that into their analysis. That's not how their system was built. Um, and I think now that you go to commerce and you're, you're thinking about things you know, in this new environment, you can build that kind of capability in from the beginning. Um, so I would say just to tie that back, I think that's another one of the opportunities with this um, shift to commerce. Yeah, there's two kind of threads that you all mentioned is the, the data sharing aspect and the need for that. Um, and then also Mir and Mariel as well earlier were mentioning, um, you know, the, the limited cooperation with our adversaries, maybe in space or a couple nations that might not want to um, sign on to any rules of the road. Um, so, of course, with data sharing, there are security implications um, or sensitivities and vulnerabilities to sharing data with China and Russia. Um, so what areas do we have opportunities for limited cooperation with China and Russia and other um, competitors in space? Um, is an issue like space debris, which Walter, you were mentioning earlier, is that an area where we might have you know, mutual harm and therefore mutual interest in solving together? Um, is Anybody can start with this one, um, whoever, whoever would like to take it most. I mean, I've been talking a lot, but but data sharing is is the thing I probably think the most uh, about in terms of my research and and 
yeah, things I spend time thinking about. Uh, so the U.S. in some ways does a, a really amazing job. We're the only country in the world that collects all of this data, runs these conjunction analyses for everything in space, and makes that data freely available. Um, and that's to everyone. That's, you know, that's to our allies. That's to our, you know, potential adversaries uh, or competitors, right? Everybody gets that information. Uh, and that's smart. That's in the U.S. interest, right? We do not want to have any objects collide in space. So we want anybody to have the information they need to avoid those collisions. Um, that said, we we only provide a certain level of detail that's that's freely available and a certain amount of information about how we come to those solutions, right? So um, I would say, again, I think this is an opportunity for commerce that they can be a little more transparent about what are the processes for developing uh, this information, you know, exactly how do you interpret the information that that's provided by the US. So I think we can do even better uh, in that area. And then I hope that there are chances for us to work with other nations who maybe aren't as transparent uh, at the moment, but do have their own systems to, to monitor, monitor these things, um, to try to get a little bit more on, on the same page. Uh, and, and to give a specific example, um, about a year ago, China uh, kind of made a complaint to the United Nations, put in a note for ball to the United Nations, saying that a Starlink satellite had come close to their human uh, station, to the, the Chinese space station. Um, and that the U.S. is responsible for this, you know, as the, the nation responsible for, for SpaceX and needs to better uh, be supervising these entities. And the U.S. responded, uh, you know, through that same framework, basically saying, you know, we disagree within our data. We don't see that Starlink went, you know, a dangerous location, uh, a dangerous distance to the Chinese space station. And I think certainly there's some political uh, things happening there as well, but I think there's a good reason to believe some of that is just differences in our data systems, potentially differences in our um, threshold for what we call risky, uh, differences in our understanding of exactly where objects are in space. And so I think there'd be a lot of benefit from trying to come together uh, in some way to, to compare that information um, and try and get a little bit closer to a, a shared understanding. So, Mariel, the um, one of the points that you raised, like what constitutes risky, uh, it's very much it depends. And I'd say it depends on two or maybe three things. Thing number one is how confident are you in the information? What are the error bars like? And the better the information, the smaller the error bars, the more confidence you have that you can tolerate a closer approach because you're confident that it's not too close. The second thing is what are the respective maneuvering capabilities of the objects that might be getting close to each other? Uh, if they have limited to no maneuvering capability, that's a different situation than if they have the ability to get out of the way fairly quickly. The third is how timely is the information that you have about the the orbits it relates to the accuracy but you might say yeah i had really good accuracy last week but i need to know what it's like today i need to know what it's like actually at the time of the perspective conjunction and if you don't get the information about a perspective conjunction until after the conjunction well it's not terribly useful so you've got all three of those things that affect the risk factor and again something that commerce can certainly do is is work on uh, improving the accuracy by bringing in all possible sources, improving the timeliness with which the information is available. And then it becomes the responsibility of the operators. If it's known what their maneuvering capabilities are, then maybe that can lead to some common rules of the road around priority, who gets to maneuver, when should they maneuver, et cetera. Yeah, completely agree. Mir, do you want to add to that? Not, not much, but just, I mean, I had a real life uh, sort of, um, you know, vignette a couple of years ago when I was at the White House, I was reading this potential conjunction happening over Pennsylvania. And uh, I, you know, one of the industry partners called it a near miss. And I was kind of concerned because it was very close to Pittsburgh or whatever big city it was going to be. And I said, does the mayor know? And people were like, no. So I called one of our government agencies and I said, can you guys do the math? And literally that 
day I was getting an hourly update and the standard of variation for the potential conjunction were like a mile, 20 meters, that kind of stuff. It was all over the place. So that got me thinking it's, you know, the industry called it right, right? They, they call it right. But at the same time, we're very American centric. We're looking at government and industry. Now imagine you look at another country and another country, you know, and we've all had Russian math teachers right in college and we're thinking how do they solve that problem right calculations vary by 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 the culture right there's a different way of reading things in different countries I, you know i'm from afghanistan we read from right to left and in america you read from left to right and so all of these things change the way you do calculations and there, there are little biases little errors that contribute to it so one of the things that i, I like what mariel said was that we need to get to an understanding of how we how are we calculating forget about how we're running the numbers, but how are we actually assigning stuff to it? And let's get, get to an agreement on that. And then once we are able to do that, then let's put it into these databases that can run these calculations. And then let's see where those databases are, you know, what errors they're generating. Because I think it goes down even further to the initial input of that information. And that's where I think culturally, uh, you know, we're seeing things differently. Uh, we see differently between government and industry and we're probably seeing that internationally different as well not saying one culture is better than the other it's just it's different ways of calculating well on one hand uh mirror i'll argue that math is math um and you know you're going to get you start with the same assumptions you're going to get the same answer um where i think you get more variability is how how well how confident are you in the data that's going into the calculation in the first place um what's the quality of the data sources and there you can end up in situations where hey i'm not sure that i trust this data source so i'm going to give it a bigger error variability in my calculation and you're right you'll get a different answer when you come out of there so understanding the assumptions and the the data quality is going to be really important and that gets back to the more you are bringing data together into a central source the more you can cross check different sources of data with other sources of data so you improve the overall quality of the result by bringing in more data sources yeah and i would say this is also a, a big opportunity for the united states you know we're already um being quite transparent in terms of providing providing data globally. But I think as you move to this commerce system, as you potentially make it more transparent, provide more insight about the processes used, bring more of these different data sets in, um, that gives the US to be, you know, the chance to be kind of the uh, main vision of what's happening in space for the global community, right? And, and the more transparent we can be, the more confident other actors can be that the, the US information about what's happening in space or the U.S. vision of what's happening in space uh, is trustworthy and is is something that everyone should use. Um, I think that also uh, really provides a benefit to the world and an opportunity for the U.S. to be a leader, right? Even if other nations choose not to increase their transparency and, and do that kind of comparison, which I would love to see that happen. But um, even without that, the U.S. improving its own transparency um, can help to build that confidence and, and to put the United States in that leadership role. Are there any other domains, um, like Mira, I know you mentioned Aaron um, Maritime earlier, and Mariel, I know you've spoken previously about weather monitoring. Um, how do, can we take examples from those domains, either specifically for this example on data sharing or more broadly for space security, rules of the road in space, um, all that? Yeah, in the report we have, um, we mentioned AIS, the Automated Information Systems for Navy, right? And how that was a voluntary program, um, but when uh, vessels, flag vessels participated in that, they would get certain types of NOAA uh, maps and weather updates and so forth, because that would encourage them to keep on reporting, right? And, and using the sensors. Now, of course, vessels routinely would maybe or still do potentially turn off the AIS because they don't want to be tracked. But for the most part, uh, most you know vessels have adopted that and it's become a standard, right? It was a U.S. standard and it became a uh, you know, global standard. So that that's something out there that could potentially be used. There are vulnerabilities with that as well. You know, if you have something that's being tracked and it's, you know, a it's a beacon, that might be a vulnerability. But 
there are things out there um, that you can tap into uh, that can help facilitate that and help with that tracking. Yeah, I would say when when you're doing something new like this, uh, to me, analogies are really helpful. You know that no one's built a you know a global SSA system that works for civil and commercial and and everyone around the world. So you know how do you figure out how to do that correctly? Uh, and to me, the weather monitoring, international weather monitoring, is a really um, interesting and useful analogy. So uh, certainly with the data sharing, you know our system for sharing global weather data has been around um, for more than 100 years, the um, International Meteorological Organization and then the World Meteorological or Meteorological Organization. Uh, and, you know, from the very beginning, there's been this idea that we need to share data freely uh, across countries, at least some data. Um, and that norm of, of data sharing has really been something that survived through lots of different changes, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of similarities. It's it's data that's relevant to everyone in the world, right? Weather doesn't stop at, at the border um, and neither does space debris, right? It goes over, you know, uh, orbits around all different countries with, with no paying no attention to what's on the ground. Um, so I think there there is that internationally inherent element that we can use to bring people together. I think the weather industry also has had the experience of going from a mostly government activity to a very much commercial involvement in that activity and thinking through what does that mean for the role of government, the role of commercial for, for open data sharing. Um, and so the meteorological community, for example, um, had a lot of debates and, and came up with ideas about, well, what is the, the core data that everyone is required to share for free um, that all nations are going to continue to make available or even, you know, certain uh, commercial entities that, that should be put into a system, right? Um, and how do you then still have room for a thriving commercial sector? Um, and I think the weather community has done that well. We have a, you know, a huge value added sector uh, in, you know, weather uh, the weather industry in general. So I think there are lessons we can we can potentially learn there. Um, and the last area that I think is interesting within um, that analogy is thinking about uh, what the responsibilities of the government are in terms of providing conjunction warnings. So these are, you know, the, the safety warnings of when there might be a, a collision in space. And I think with the weather community, we have, you know, severe weather warnings, severe weather watches. Um, and the government, again, had to had to struggle with, you know, what does the government need to provide? What can commercial entities provide? Um, you know, how do we ensure that something that is a safety product, right, and that is saving lives and or property um, to make sure that that's available to people um, and easily understandable and at a, at a level of quality that's going to allow them to take action, um, even if they're not paying for a, for a product. So, Maria, one of the things that you're you're uh, there's a thread that you're pulling on, which is when the government is standing behind the authoritativeness of a data source, um, there's it's you know it's a pretty high bar for being comfortable to put the stamp of approval on it. In the space traffic management area, when you're starting with zero or you're starting with something that does not yet have a seal of approval, there's still value in having the data available before it's been you know, officially validated. So something for us to be just aware of, uh, there is certainly a tendency on the part of government agencies, if they have a responsibility for providing authoritative data to be very conservative, and that may actually slow down providing what would otherwise be useful data um, while they become comfortable. So just I wouldn't, I wouldn't set the bar so high that it takes a long time to cross the bar. I think we're at a stage yeah. where any progress is likely to be good progress and it'll eventually get better over time. And eventually there will be well understood standards for data quality and so forth, but let's not let that get in the way. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting point. And I think these are exactly the discussions that that need to happen now is how do you balance um increasing that capability, right? And increasing the, you know, the accuracy or the precision of these forecasts with, um, you know, your confidence levels, for example, right? And in, in, in your forecast and in, the, in your data. So, yeah, I mean, I think you definitely have to balance those things. If you're kind of overly conservative, you're 
um, that can have the best product, or you might even have a commercial entity that that can get there first compared to the government. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's absolutely a trade-off we need to have in mind. I mean, you're seeing that actually, you, you hit the weather industry and you're seeing that very much. And there are players, commercial players in the weather industry. In fact, Maxar is one of them where uh, providing a time advantage by virtue of having uh, a an investment in, in our case, actually, it's running models that were developed uh, by the government, but running them in a computer infrastructure that allows us to get it done faster. Um, there are ways of the industry stepping into the breach. And as long as there is not a, a blocking function on the part of government that says, no, 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 that's our job. You're not allowed to do that. Um, then there's an opportunity for both to coexist. And I think that also is important in the regulatory process, which is what does the government prevent? What does the government uh, require? What does the government allow uh, and doing like looking at all of those aspects as as a framework gets developed. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point. And I think especially when you think about the conjunction warnings, for example, what it what should the government be providing? What what level um, of of quality of product, and also how are they providing it? Right. One of the big things in the uh, weather sector in the U.S. is this kind of value-added sector that actually takes, for the most part, um, the government forecast right and the government data. Um, and repackages that and provides it to people um, in a way that that is more user friendly and is what people want. And you know, overwhelmingly, people choose to go, you know, to weather.com and AccuWeather and these other kind of commercial um, weather providers rather than say weather.gov or directly to to kind of the the government data itself. And part of that is commercial entities have done a really good job of paying attention to how how to package that and how to get to customers in a way that's going to be most useful for them. So I would imagine there's a lot of opportunity there uh, in the SSA world as well, or STM. I'd like to stick with that point on, you know, commercial and industry just being such a like imperative part of the space traffic management ecosystem that we have today. Um, that's in our issue brief. Um, one of the key recommendations is viewing industry along with our allies as equal partners. Um, so Walter, maybe I'll turn to you first, but um, where are space companies plugging in or where can they to complement government efforts and where can the government do a better job of incorporating industry perspectives? Like, are there specific forums or recommendations you have there? So, you know, in the space traffic, um, certainly sp too many acronyms here, um, space situational awareness, space tracking, et cetera. Uh, you have commercial companies that are actually contributing data, Leo Labs being an example, there are others. Uh, that are contributing data for the improved picture. Uh, you also have commercial operators that are proactively communicating their own orbit data uh, to the um, uh, currently DoD, but soon to be moving over to commerce. Uh, I think those are very good first steps. The, the places where you're going to need, I think, government to be the one leaning in uh, before you see commercial uh, development. One is going to be if there is a significant need to expand the ability to do observation of objects in space to get their orbits, um, that's a capital investment. And just like we have a lot of aviation radars that were not developed by commercial entities, they were funded by government entities. Uh, there's likely to be, maybe it's via an anchor tenancy arrangement. Uh, there are a variety of business models that actually work well. Um, it can be an anchor tenancy, it can be uh, buying as a service. Uh, generally speaking, as a service works pretty well because the industry is free to develop against a a product or service spec as opposed to having everything being dictated by the government. So you drive a lot of good innovation that way. Um, when you get to things like debris removal, there again, it starts out as a public good where I think having governments lean in, but there may very well be opportunities for it to be a, a service as well for commercial operators. It may be that, for example, for a mega constellation, it may be more cost-effective to pay a retainer for a debris removal service 
than to incorporate the necessary redundancy and reliability in each element of that mega constellation to hit whatever, however many nines of reliability you need to hit. I don't know whether that's the case, but that's a way that you could start to see a commercial service materialize. I think it's too early to tell at this stage of the game. And uh, I do think that it's going to be necessary for government to lead in areas like debris remediation. Uh, and probably if there's going to be a significant expansion in the ability to observe, whether it's from the ground or or from satellites observing other satellites. Thanks. Um, switching gears a little bit. Um, Mir, I want to turn to you on this one first, um, and then Walter and Mariel would love to hear from you as well. Um, but we're talking a lot about space traffic management broadly, but obviously it varies um, orbit by orbit, um, and we're starting to see discussions or um, even commercial advancements um, talking about cislunar space. Um, so how should the deliberations about space traffic management and uh, development of a framework for space traffic management um, differ for cislunar space and even other orbits than it does for low Earth orbit? That's a really good question. And I think that General Shaw mentioned that as well a little bit with the space domain awareness, right? And so, I mean, LEO is sort of like New York City, right? And so cislunar is a little bit, a couple hours outside of New York, right? So how much more uh, precision do you need for when, as you get out of New York? You, you will need precision. Um, and I think that's the part where we really need to focus in on that LEO is the immediate uh, concern uh, because most of commercial is operating there. But I mean, business and national security is moving into cislunar. And so we need to have uh, that space domain awareness perspective and then start putting the STM as it's needed in those different uh, locations, right? Because if you're going to cislunar, you got to go through LEO, right? And so uh, that's something that is a concern as uh, this, the business and the market for cis cislunar uh, heats up, uh, especially with Artemis and other uh, activities that, that are going on. So I think that's going to be something to to look forward to. And, you know, all of that other uh, sort of activity is going to transit through LEO. So I think you can't you can't just turn a blind eye to that. You have to calculate that into whatever you are looking at in LEO. And then I would say with that is also the deorbiting aspect right now, if, if you're going to deorbit things, uh, especially if they're not maneuverable, you know, you have to start thinking about how that's going to affect Leo as well, um, or, or, or Earth as they're coming onto Earth, right? You just don't want things to fall to it. But I think that's an important aspect. And um, if the industry pro progresses, as we think, cislunar is going to be a pretty hot market in the you know, next decade or two. So maybe I can add just a couple of things. Uh, in addition to LEO, I would include geosynchronous orbit because there is still a lot of commercial activity up in geosynchronous orbit. And interestingly enough, there probably are better rules of the road established for geosynchronous orbit than there are for low Earth orbit, part because of some of the unique characteristics of the orbit where there actually are orbit slots that get allocated. Um, so that's a, uh, you know, I, I'd probably include that in the, these are the areas that one needs to manage. Um, in terms of uh, like observation beyond the immediate proximity to Earth, Leo is obviously the easiest to observe from the ground. Um, you're probably going to need to see more space to space observation uh, as you start getting further and further out um, just because, because of the distances that are involved. Yeah, I, I'll just mostly agree with what's been said already. So I agree with Mir, the, you know, uh, Earth orbit with Leo and Geo, I think is the immediate issue. You know, that's the problem we we probably should have solved yesterday. Um, I think with cis lunar, you know, there are projections of, you know, 50 different missions or so going in the next, the next decade. So it does seem like uh, if all goes according to plan, there's a ramp up of activity there. Um, and I am I'm sympathetic to the idea that the the U.S. military, in particular, and, and other actors, would like to have some awareness of of what's out there and and where it's going and what it's doing. Right to go to Mir's analogy of you know we're we're in New York right now with no traffic lights. We probably need to fix that first. But also you know if a car now and then is leaving New York, 
Um, right now we're sort of in the situation of like, well, we knew it left the city, but no idea where, <laughs> where in the United States it is now, right? We just don't have the capability to, to look out there. Um, and so I, I can imagine that that will be one of the capabilities that, um, you know, is on the docket to, to get developed, but uh, maybe not as near term as, as dealing with Earth orbit. Walter, did you want to add there? Um, I'll come back to it. Okay. Um, great. So I'm going to turn over now to a few audience questions. Thanks to our audience for asking a lot of great questions today. Um, first, I'll go to Brian Whedon's question. Um, he asks, and this kind of goes to our earlier point on, um, you know, the transition from DOD to DOC for space traffic management. Um, how do panelists suggest engaging Congress to give not only the authority, but the funding to conduct space traffic management? Mir, I might turn to you first, because I know you said that um, you would suggest that um, Congress you know, provide the appropriate resourcing. I mean, I, I don't know how to approach Congress, but you know, I'm hoping that hopefully their staffers are listening to this. But I think one of the things that we need to do is, uh, you know, last month or two months ago, Defense Innovation Unit, AFRL Lab, and Space Force they put together the State of the Space Industrial Base, is potentially uh, the Space Council, the National Space Council, uh, reaching out to that organizations and say, hey. We need something on this and get all the industry partners that you usually bring in, which is a couple of hundred in here. And let's start talking about what STM is and what are the requirements for uh, the Office of Space Commerce? What would you like to see out of it? And also bring space commerce folks in to say, these are the things that are missing that we don't have and have a, you know, a, a little report or something, something tangible that, you know, industry partners can hold as they're going to lobby on the Hill. Um, as well as government folks can have their legislative affairs folks uh, go up to the hill. And that I think we could probably count on the Department of Defense going with commerce and saying, hey, help help out our sister you know, agency with the funding. And I think that's the only way we can do that. Uh, anecdotally, uh, one-offs without something uh, is not going to really affect Congress. But And it doesn't have to be uh, that you know, organization, maybe Space Council has a RFI or something to the, the body and they, they tabulate that together. Um, but I think that's something that needs to happen and needs to be convincing so, so that they're convinced by it. Uh, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of money on things that are not feeding and clothing Americans. Uh, you know, America is, is an inflation. This is, I love space, but the immediate need is on the streets and, on, and in people's homes. So we need to have a compelling story to tell to elected officials on the Hill. Yeah, I can maybe add. So I think we are moving in that direction that Congress does seem to be getting more and more support for, for building this up at Commerce and the, the budget I think did increase in the, in the most recent budget. Um, but I think one of the things that's missing and is difficult, it's almost a little bit of a chicken and egg kind of the problem is Congress wants to know exactly what that money is gonna be used for. Um, and what does this system look like? Are we are we leveraging commercial? Are we buying? Are we doing this data as a service? Are we are you building a brand new thing? Are you trying to fully replicate what DOD did? Or are you you know what is it exactly? You know how, how big is this going to be at the end of the day? What's the long term vision? And I think there's still debate, you know, rightfully on those topics. And part of what commerce is trying to do, you know, I, I think they have. Um, Rich Dabello in, in charge, who is a, I, I'm going to do an amazing job. I'm sure he's, he's wonderful, but, um, you know, part of what he needs some, some funding and support to do is go out and, and talk to all these different stakeholders and really, you know, lay out that vision of, of what it's going to look like. And so I think, you know, that's one, that's the stage I see us in is this back and forth between, you know, figuring out what is the right system and defining that so that then you can get that buy-in uh, from Congress to go to the next step and start to implement things. I guess the only thing I'd add is like with anything, um, think big, start small, move fast, deliver value every step along the way. So um, it's great to lay out the broad nature of the problem, bringing forward things that can be done that can actually implement and deliver value in the near term uh, is uh, should never be forsaken uh, in the interest of coming to the solution to all things. Uh, and there's a lot that can be done without having to solve the complete problem that will make positive progress. And that would be a, a good way to approach what can we identify to do in the near term? Yes, there are things that are longer term, but you know what? 
having uh, just having a simple mechanism for being able to share orbit data uh, and being able to pass it out quickly. Um, good low hanging fruit. Thanks. Another audience question from Maria Bragren. Um, so we've spoken a lot about um, how you know this needs to be an international effort. Um, so which are the relevant international forums for space traffic management? Um, and what next steps would the panel like to see regarding international cooperation? Mariel, can I turn to you first? <laughs> yeah, I could try. Although the, the thing I mentioned earlier is that, you know, I don't know that there is an obvious forum for this discussion. So, you know, certainly we have entities within the United Nations that have dealt with different aspects of this. So, you know, UN Copious on the, the kind of safety side has been a, a location for some of these discussions. Um, there's, I think some of the security stuff maybe gets touched on by this open-ended working group that's out there right now, thinking about kind of norms of behavior. Um, but there isn't one entity that we've identified for space traffic management, um, specifically. And so I think, you know, maybe one of those existing forums is the right place. I mean, maybe it's a separate multilateral um, activity that that we need to engage in. But even then, you probably need some some framework for that. You know, some way that you're going to work through those issues and, and bring people together. So, um, I think that's still pretty open question. How did things like the ITU get started, right, for coordinating spectrum, uh, in particular satellite to Earth spectrum? And maybe it's worthwhile looking at like how do those things come about and i don't yeah. know whether that's a good model or a bad model but there's at least an international organization that deals with issues of coordinating across multiple countries relative to frequency allocation yeah i, I think that's a really good point uh walter i know you know the one challenge is they're setting up an international organization is so slow <laughs> you know and so many of us you know multiple times we've all said in uh near term and i think there's also sensitivity of of you know, what uh, authority does that group have and all of those upfront decisions. Um, I had some some students in a, in a class did a project looking at something like the in the the Paris Agreement where you, you know, have kind of a, a framework for the issues you want to think about and the things you want to work on. And then you actually bring together people every year to try to make additional progress. Now, I don't know if uh, Kyoto and, and Paris is our <laughs> like, best example of a, a successful international framework, but I think, you know, um, in some ways it, it has been uh, quite successful. And I think it, it's at least a, an interesting, interesting point to look at. I mean, certainly one way you can bootstrap it is by uh, starting with industry, industry led uh, agreements on norms of behavior um, and that gets back to like you've you've created an existence proof for this is something that can actually work, uh, and that may be a way to bootstrap international agreement. So, so we have a thing. I mean, we we don't want to put this back into the defense or national security realm, but we have you know precedents, right? We have the Five I conferences between Anglo countries. We have Sri War Games, which is you know now opening up to India, right as well. Um, and, you know, we also have something like NATO that we can discuss that. But, you know, I'm, I'm in agreement with you that I want to take it out of the national security realm and more into the civil uh, society realm. Right. And, and that's an important piece. But that's something we need to consider that maybe the launch pad is not necessarily perhaps in NATO, but using, uh, an, you know, a body that mirrors NATO, because that's where you like like minded nations are. So it's not just NATO, but it's NATO plus Japan, Australia. Right. Something like that. Um, but we need to think about it a little bit more uh, building on what we already have. If you take it to the UN, maybe it will get pummeled out really fast, but most likely it won't, right? And, and then it goes down to who's paying for all of this, right? Who's underwriting all of these things that people are signing up for, nations are signing up for. I think we, we, we really have our work cut out on the international community unless we step up and start leading with uh, nations that really see eye to eye with us immediately and then pick up people, pick up nations along the way. Thanks. Um, I'd like to just close out our discussion with one last question. I'm looking forward to the way ahead for space traffic management. Um, could you each just share in your view what ought to be the top priority for the US government and international community um, at large in addressing space traffic management? 
Um, Walter, I'll start with you. Boy, the top priority, um, it's kind of like asking me which of my children is my favorite. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's hard to, it'd be hard to put my finger on a single thing. Certainly, um, having the mechanism in place for, for data sharing, picking up so that we don't lose a beat relative to what has currently existed within the DOD. Uh, I think that's that's on the short list of making sure that that happens. Um, and then I think the other would be uh, build on some of the work that's beginning to happen relative to norms of operation in space uh, and start building a framework around that, uh, whether it's the uh, the FCC five years to deorbit. Uh, there are uh, mere back to your point about uh, things falling from the sky. There are actually guidelines around if you can't show that the casualty probability is below a certain threshold, then you need to do a controlled re-entry. So you're not flying in over Pittsburgh, for example. Uh, you're putting it in the South Pacific in some open ocean area. Uh, so I think beginning to develop some of the regulatory framework, and it doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to cover everything, but at least start getting things codified. Uh, if nothing else, to uh, catch up with the way industry is already starting to behave. Thanks. Mario, do you want to take it next? Sure. Um, yeah, I agree. It's, it's difficult to set a priority. I would say the, the, you know, getting the Department of Commerce system up and running. I like Walter's idea of, you know, doing it in steps, get, you know, what you know, uh, some of that low-hanging fruit, but also get that that vision identified and get that system going. I think that the U.S. has a lot of opportunity to to lead in this area and and do things that really benefit um, the the world as a whole. And so I think getting our national system, you know, figured out and, and functioning the way we want, or getting at least on that path, I think is a really important first step. And then starting to have that international discussion, you know. International discussion, despite all our, our best wishes, is never that fast. Um, so I think getting that started now and getting the ideas out there so that that, that debate can be going on. Um, I think I kind of squeezed two priorities in there, but but that's what they would be. Mayor, you got the last word. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that was said. I mean, like we said earlier, we need to define what SSA and STM means and how they differ from each other. And we need to, uh, as a sort of a confidence building measure, we need to calculate how we do the science, like Walter said, right? We need to sit down with the Chinese. We need to sit down with the Russians and say, how are you calculating this? And, and get all those errors out of out of our sort of uh, our, our, our doubt factor, right? We don't wanna have any doubt of whether we trust their numbers and they trust our numbers. So I think that's an important piece. As far as standards, I think the norms of behavior, all of that, we need to really focus in on that. But I think maneuverability and cybersecurity is a big factor. What goes up and what must come down we need to ensure that, um, and then uh, in the long term, I would say, you know, big building that pic big picture, what General Shaw said, that space domain awareness, understanding what, not just our little world, but not, not our orbit of LEO, but what's going on in GEO and what's going on in CISLUNAR and how all of that ties up. Great, thanks. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, thanks everyone for joining this discussion, to our panelists, um, to General Shaw for joining us earlier and to all um, our whole audience. Uh, we hope to see you for future advance, uh, events with the Atlantic Council's Forward Defense team um, as we continue our analysis on space security. Have a nice day.